Good morning. Good morning. Are y'all awake at nine o'clock this morning? Yeah. What about that worship team this morning? Yeah. Come on. Come on, come on. So good, so good, so good. And uh, so good to see Mason up here. I love that we're just bringing up new talent and young people and serving the Lord. And that's just part of our house. And we love that. And Mason, you did a fabulous job. I'm sure Ryan's crying uh, in the sound room to see you up here because that means he's probably back there doing right now a one-man show. And so uh, anyway, so we're raising up, we're raising up an army. Uh, today I want to talk to you, uh, <clears throat> share with you just a couple things before I preach is, is that Ron Till is going to be here. So let's make plans to be out. It's just a couple of weeks away and uh, let's just make that big. And, and, and you know what? We're really doing that because we want to have an opportunity. It's a Friday. It's coming Friday. Did I say two weeks away? Yeah, not this Friday. It's coming up this Friday. Is it this Friday? Which Friday is it? Now y'all know for sure. All right, so it's coming up this coming Friday. So I have a few things going on. So uh, anyway, so let's, let's make sure we're all out. For it. I'll be here. Even though I don't know what Friday it is, I'll be here. So it's going to be good. All right, so I want to ask you a question this morning. I want to ask you a question. Uh, how many in here would like to have more money? AJ don't want any more. That's awesome. I'm not going to give him any. Somebody said they didn't want to work anymore. I just want more money. All right. It's always an interesting subject to talk at church about money, but today I'm going to share a little bit about money, and, uh, and uh, there's a couple stories uh, I want to share with you, but I want you to know before I share those stories that there, as you know, we just finished up last Sunday on mind games, and talking about spiritual warfare and all that, we should have just extended it to this week, because as I begin to prepare for this, there's really a spirit that's behind money. There's a, there's a spirit that's behind money, and, and uh, so I'm going to talk to you a little bit today about that spirit that's behind money. And so uh, there's, there's two stories in the Bible that, that really stand out to me and um, when we talk about money, and I want to use those stories, and I want you to think about them. We're going to read about those, but I want you to think about those and reference those as I'm teaching today. I want you to think about these two individuals, Okay. So Matthew 19, <coughs> excuse me, Matthew 19 and verse 18, if you want to click there or turn in your Bibles there, um, Matthew 19, Jesus said, don't murder, don't commit adulteries, don't steal, don't lie, honor your father and mother, and love those around you as you love yourself. But I've always obeyed that, the young man was replying to him. I've always obeyed every one of these without fail. The young man replied, what else do I lack? And Jesus said to him, if you really want to be perfect, go immediately. Everybody say immediately. And sell everything you own and give all your money to the poor and your treasures will be transferred into heaven. Then come back and follow me for the rest of your life. And when the young man heard these words, he walked away, what? Angry. angry. For he was extremely wealthy. He walked away angry because he was extremely wealthy. Luke 21. And Jesus was in the temple. Luke 21. Jesus was in the temple observing all the wealthy waiting to be noticed as they came with their offering. And he noticed a very poor widow dropping two small coins, copper coins, in the offering box. Listen to me, he said. The poor widow has given a large offering, a larger offering than any of the wealthy. For the rich only gave out of their surplus, but she sacrificed out of her poverty and gave to God all that she had to live. She gave all that she had to live on. 
in Luke the 16th chapter, in Luke the 16th chapter, and I'll give you a minute to turn there, the 10th verse. The scripture says, he who is faithful in every little thing, I'm reading from the Amplified. He who is faithful in every little thing is faithful also in much. And he who is dishonest and unjust in every little thing is dishonest and unjust also in much. Therefore, if you have not been faithful in the case of the unrighteous mammon, deceitful riches, money, and possessions, who will entrust you to true riches? And I'm going to read some more of that in just a minute so you can stay there, but I want to stop right here for just a moment. So what is unrighteous mammon? The word uh, mammon means wealth or riches, wealth or riches. And really, it's, the, it, it is the, it's a god, it's the when we talk about this, it's not just talking about wealth and riches, but it's talking about the God of riches. So, so when we think about money, we think about these bills, you know, that have passed through gazillions of hands. And it's so funny. I just laugh, you know, about this because we're all worried about what we eat and where we go and all this. And then we just handle money. <laughs> you ever thought about who all handled that money? That's a side note. Anyway, and so... So we think about money, we think about dollar bills, but honestly, what we're talking about today is not really this cash, we're, we're talking about the God or the spirit of money. Because there's a spirit behind every dollar, there's a spirit behind money. And so this uh, scripture's talking about, so the unrighteous mammon is worldly wealth that is obtained through many different ways, through work or through inheritance or how, however you have received money. So this mammon, this money, this unrighteous mammon is this material money that we, that we have to have to live. I, I mean, went to the grocery store the other day and I got ready to check out at, at uh, Costco and they didn't say, sir, you are so good looking today, you don't have to pay. They asked me for money. And so, I, actually, I, I meant to point this out today because we've moved a lot away from uh, the dollar bill, and now, and, you know, this is our money. This is our money. And no telling what's going to be next, but this is our money. So, th there's a spirit behind this, and most of the people have too many of those, and they're overloaded. And so, we... They didn't just say, hey, look, just because you're nice today, just because you get brownie points, we're going to give you your groceries. No, they charged me for that. There was money involved. So I want you to understand that I know that in this world that we need money to exist. And so this money can become so unrighteous because it comes from an unrighteous place. Are you with me this morning? So as we obtain money... And, and we receive money, we understand that. So when we recognize that money has a spirit attached to it so that we can begin to recognize the voices that speak to us and how we understand the difference between the righteous and the unrighteous. Somebody said, well, pastor, I'm not sure that I believe that there is, there's a spirit behind money. Well, then you explain to me then what that voice is that you hear when someone says give. You know, have you ever had anybody that, that you saw the phone ring and you went to pick it up and you knew that they were calling? Either you had a bill that you needed to pay or, or that there was somebody calling for a donation or, you know, something of that nature. And you was looking at the phone saying, and there were voices that were speaking. Don't answer that. Yeah, don't answer that phone. And so, and so there is something attached to this money that we seem to ignore a lot of times. And we just look at it as a, ends to the, a means to the ends. But really, there's a spirit that's involved with our finances. Uh, and I want, you to, I want you to think about this morning about people who think about their money and they hide their money away because they're so worried that there's going to be this catastrophic thing happen in their life. And if they don't have money to fix their problem, then their problem is going to be too great. And they live in this constant fear. 
my daddy always said this, and uh, my dad always said, if money could fix your problem, you really didn't have one. Because money comes and money goes. My dad also said he's been rich and he's been poor and rich is better. I will add that in. <laughs> but, but money comes and goes, and, but money will not always fix your problem. And when we become dependent upon the money, then we're already in trouble because it's become our God. Luke says it like this in the ESV, Luke 16, I'm reading the, the same, same scripture, just in a different version. If you have not handled the riches of this world with integrity, why should you be entrusted with eternal treasures of the spiritual world? If we can't handle this things that come and go with integrity and from a spiritual point of view, how much more can we not handle spiritual things that are eternal? I mean, those that at the end of the day, when you die, your money is not going to matter one iota. You heard the story about the, the man who told his wife. He said, I, I'm, I'll, when I die, I want you to put all my money in, in my casket. And she wrote a check and dropped it in. <laughs> all the money in the world is not going to affect your life eternal. It's not. Verse 12. And if you have not Prove faithful in that which belongs to others, whether God or man, who will give you that which is your own? That is true riches. How do we see money? How do we see money? Do we see money as God's money or man's money? How do we look at our cash? How do we look at our bank accounts? Do we see that as God's or do we see that as ours? And how do we use the money that God puts in our hands? Verse 13 says, No servant is able to serve two masters. Either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will stand by and be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. <coughs> Riches are anything in which you trust in or what you rely on. So when we rely on our finances, what we're saying is, this is what I worship. This is what I worship. This has become my, my, my God. And when money controls us, it is uh, the number one deciding factor of how we live and how we do business and what we're totally depend upon. And when we do not, then at that point, we do not have money. Money has us. That's right. That's right. No longer do we have money, but money has us. Right. I just want to pause for a moment and tell you there have been some difficult times in my life where I became very, very, very concerned and to the point of having a breakdown about not having enough money. And I will tell you one little story real quickly. When you let that drive you, it can drive you bananas. Yes. I remember one time when Angela and I were first pastoring and, and things were extremely tight. And um, I was working a lot, and I've told this story before, so you may have heard it that she was, I, I worked early job, early in the morning, and then I came home and did ministry in the evening, and so we really didn't get to see each other much, kind of like waved, hi, how you doing? And so I was on my way out the door one day, and she said to me, she says, we do not have enough money to buy diapers, and there's not much food in the house, and X, Y, Z, and in my haste, I said, well, it'll be all right. God's got us. It's fine. We'll be all right. And I'm sure she was thinking at the time, yeah, while you're leaving, I have two diapers left to end this story. And so I was on my way out the door, and 
I drove to the corner and I forgot my phone, so I drove back to the house. And when I drove back to the house, it was just seconds, it was just minutes. When I drove back to the house, she was standing on the front porch and she had this huge smile on her face. And I was thinking, God has showed up and I'm going to be able to get my phone and she's not going to, you know, take me out. <laughs> and so she had this big f smile on her face. And while she was standing on the porch, probably pondering, wondering, he's leaving and he doesn't really care, which I really did care. I just didn't know where I was going to get any money. She opened the mailbox and someone in our family who did not attend church regularly, but it was the end of the year and they wanted a tax deduction, so they sent us a tithing check. Now you can say that's terrible, but that day was hallelujah <laughs> for the check. And they sent us $1,000, you'd have thought we won the lottery. Because it was the miracle in the moment. It was the miracle in the moment. Can I tell you today that I have never, ever seen God ever fail never. us? Amen. There have been some times I was sweating bullets, but I've never seen God fail us. God always comes through. Here's the problem. When we look at money as our total source, we miss the kingdom of God. We miss it. We miss out on the very purpose of the kingdom of God. You say, Pastor, why are you talking about money? You know money is mentioned a lot in the Bible. Why is it mentioned a lot in the Bible? Because it's spiritual. And it has strongholds on our life. And it controls the majority of the people that you know. Money controls their life. And one way or the other. And when we don't understand money being spiritual, we treat it as a God. And we worship it in one way or the other. So we have to know that money in and of itself is not evil. The scripture says this, 1 Timothy 10, 6, 10. For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. It is through the craving that some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pings or many demons. It's the love of money that people have lost their faith in God and they've wandered away and allowed the demonic activity of the world to enter their life. And so when they get stressed out over finances, over money, Instead of saying, God, I'm trusting you for a breakthrough, they go and do something that they may not should do. Yeah. I'm going to talk about that just a minute. This is getting pastor mode here just for a second. Listen, I want to talk to all you mighty, awesome men of God in this house. I believe in hard work. The Bible teaches us, this is not my notes, so this is going to be really good. <laughs> the Bible teaches us if you don't work, you don't deserve to eat. That is also a principle. If you're sitting on the front porch and you call that having faith, then maybe you will starve to death. I don't know. But, but you should work. Well, let me help you with something. There needs to be a balance in that also. You don't need to work so much that your family suffers. The Bible says that a man that doesn't provide for his family is worse than a non-believer or an infidel. Sometimes us men, me included, have worked very diligently in providing finances and have left out some security that needs to be there. Like, it's more than bringing home the bacon, it's bringing home the blessing. It's more than just making money, it's being there to help raise your kids and speaking into their lives. And taking those moments, yesterday, uh, day before yesterday, I, I went out, Hannah's playing volleyball, and uh, so I went out to help her play volleyball, and I was amazed at how excited that she was that I just went, she's trying to learn how to serve, and I just tossed the ball back to her, and she had hit it back to me, and I tossed the ball. Those moments are priceless. Yeah, 
Don't get so busy. Here's where the spirit of money can come in. Don't get so busy trying to obtain wealth that it becomes your God. Now there, hold up before you get all sideways with me in your head. There are seasons in our life when we have to put our hand to the plow and there has to be a work season that was required of us for that season. But I'm going to tell you something. You can become addicted to work. You can, you can become, you don't need to be free of that, huh? I, I, you can become addicted to making money. You can become addicted to that. Let me tell you something. There can be a place in your life that you can have all the money in the world, but you have become addicted to making money, and the money is the challenge, not the money in itself. And then you lose your way. And it will cause you to bend your morals and it will cause you to change your objective and it will cause you to do things that you should not do because the love of money has now been rooted in your spirit am i being clear today but for you to have wealth and to have riches is not a sin some people say, well, you got to be poor to be saved. No, bless God. I don't plan on being poor because i got a great God, and he's going to bless me, and I'm going to put my hand to the plow, and I'm going to work. Uh, God does not want me to be poor. Amen. As a matter of fact, God wants me to live in what the Scripture says? In a... Right? And so, and, and with that said, I have to live within my... Yes, come on. I can't live outside of my means. I can't live with too much credit card debt. That's right. When somebody needs a gift, some of them credit cards can be evil in and of themselves. And we live in this place where this money gets a hold of us. Here's, here's what I believe about people. I believe that people are, are for the most part, are generous. You know, we talk about how stingy people are. and I, I don't really believe that. I believe that people mostly are generous. And we see that like when we see a storm like we just saw in North Carolina. Or we see uh, situations where people are mostly generous. But the problem with it is, it's because we have got caught up in this world of money and overextended ourselves. Most people can't afford to be generous. So money controls their life. There's people who had nervous breakdowns over money. The number two reason people get divorced is over money. Suicide because of money. So the money in and of itself has is not evil, but what is attached to it when it is unrighteous mammon can control our lives. Are y'all with me this morning? I love that y'all are being attentive, man. I got everybody who's just listening. So good. So when we crave money over relationship with God, over relationship with our family, it becomes our God, and we do ungodly things to get it. But to have it is not sin. This does not mean that we don't manage our money. This does not mean we don't live within our means. So we have to plan on what and how we direct our money. Can I get a better amen? Oh, amen. So when we have money and we've been blessed to sow into the kingdom of God, one thing we need to understand is that our finances, every, when we understand that when we give our, give our money to God, I'm going to talk about tithing in a minute, but just right now I want to talk about your paycheck on Friday afternoon, and you look at it, and when you look at that, if you start looking at that paycheck as this is God's money, how will I spend his money? Now we get a different perspective, right? As long as we're saying this is my money and I can spend it any way I want to, you will. But this is God's money. And how will I spend God's money? And here's the thing about God. God is the epitome of generosity. 
<laughs> right? He is more generous than all of us ever thought about being. I mean, he is, the, he is generous above anything we've ever seen. And so God in his generosity says this, I want you to give me the first fruits of your labor. I want you to give me 10% and you have the, 90, the, the other 90% of my money uh, as for you to do with what is necessary. Now that changes our perspective because we're like, oh, well, well 10% of my money I give to God. No, 90% of God's money he gives to you. And so my tithing then is not something that I do because just because I have to help keep the lights on at the church. But my tithing is a offering unto the Lord of thanksgiving. So when I give up my tithing, you know what I'm doing? I am saying, Lord, you are first in my life. When I give them my tithing of my time and my talent, I'm saying, God, you're first in my life. And, Lord, I'm not only going to give them my tithing, but, Lord, I'm going to learn to see my money as your money. And so when I see someone that needs help, I'm going to willingly give them help. I'm going to bless them. I'm going to help them because, I, you know what I'm doing? I'm breaking the spirit of this world off of me. And I'm storing up treasures that are eternal and not temporal. So when I'm serving, when I'm giving, when I'm giving to missionaries, look, I, I'm, I'm giving my money to a missionary. This, I got, I'm, I'm, I'm going to write a check for that missionary. That missionary is in Iraq, maybe, Neil, our missionary to Iraq. And he is over there witnessing the people and their souls being saved and there's life happening and transformed lives. You know what you're doing? You're filling up the kingdom of God. And so you've taken what was unrighteous mammon and you've made it righteous mammon. You're redeeming the the unrighteous mammon and making it holy. Are y'all with me this morning? And so no longer does it have a hold on you, but you have a hold on it. Come on, that's a good word. Prosperity. Here's the problem with the prosperity message. As much as I believe that God wants us to be blessed, the prosperity message teaches us, if you give $100 in the often, the Lord's going to give you $20,000 and a Mercedes Benz to go with it. That's the prosperity message. The prosperity message can leave us in a really weird place because... Because then when, when things are not going good and we have this high expectation that God owes me something, <laughs> then we start blaming God for our financial problems. Oh. And so then we start saying, God, look, God, instead of saying, God, bless me because I'm broke and you're my daddy, we start saying, God, you owe me because I gave. Yeah, that is good. Thank you. <laughs> so if we miss out on the goodness of God, because we have, we, this has become our God. And so we have this expectation that's greater than his generosity, because we now have God owes me a debt. Am I making any sense to you this morning? So you know what I give? I give trust in God that he's going to supply all of my needs according to his riches and glory. I mean, those that his riches and glory are endless. Right. I'll never forget when our kids first went to North Lake Christian and, and uh, a lot of their friends over there were pulling up to school in their uh, brand new BMWs and their brand new Range Rovers. You know, they just turned 16 and, and they just got this, you know, fine car, which I'm glad for them. I'm not critical of that their parents can afford it that's fine with me and my kids would come home and their Land Rover and their uh their not their Land Rover I wish there was a Land Rover and their Toyota 4Runner that was you know well used and paid for and uh they would say dad we're poor and, and what they were doing they were comparing their car and their house to these peop other people, and they were saying, Dad, we're poor. I'd say, we're not poor. 
I've said, when, when's the last time you didn't eat? Right. When's the last time you didn't, you didn't get the clothes you need? When's the last time, when, when's the last time you went without something? No, you're not driving a, a, a Benz, but it's okay. But here's the thing I want you to look at. I want you to look at your wealth from a different perspective. We very seldom go to the doctor because we trust God with our health. We very seldom have, we don't have a lot of confusion in our home. It's because we have a godly home. And I'm not saying others don't, but you need to measure your wealth by something greater than what you see. We have God in our home. We have the blessings of God on our life. There's nothing greater than that. But, Daddy, we broke. Well, sometimes we are. But God is always faithful, and we're never without. Come on, can I get a better amen? Am I helping anybody today? So we're not going to let the spirit of mammon control us, but we're going to love God with all of our heart, with all of our soul, with all of our mind, and trust him for everything in our life. So the goodness of God, he's always good. When this is our God, it's not always good. He's always faithful. He never turns his back on us. He's yea and amen. So here's what I want to end with today. I want to close with today. Worship team, you can come. What I want most today is to be like the widow. To say, I'm all in, Lord. I'm all in. I've heard a lot of debate over the passage of Scripture, the parable Jesus told about the rich young ruler. And some people say, well, he really didn't mean give all that you have. He didn't really mean that. It was, he, he was, he was say, it was kind of a, like he was testing him to see if he wanted to do it. He didn't really mean that. I was like, well, Jesus usually means what he says. And he said, sell all that you have and give it to the poor. He was looking for a response from this young man that would say, you know what? I'm all in, God. I'm all in. I'm all in. I'm 100% in. I want us today to break this. There's two things that I want to see broken off, off of this house. And I, I don't think we struggle with it a lot. But I want us to make sure that we don't ever, we understand that we are not supposed to live in the spirit of poverty. A spirit of poverty bleeds into everything in your life. Let me tell you how a spirit of poverty oftentimes looks. I got this... I got this money, or I got this house, or I got this car, or I have this situation, and I'm going to hold on to it as tight as I can, because I probably will never get it again. I've worked too hard for this to let it go. I will never let this go. I'm going to hold on to this. And that spirit of poverty actually doesn't allow you to be blessed because you won't let go of what belongs to God. And that's just not just money. That's an attitude. That's a spirit. And you hoard up everything just holding on to it. How many of us that God can't bless you with your hand closed? You say, God, I need you to bless me. He says, I can't bless you because you got your fist wrapped around your, 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 your poverty spirit. And you're holding on to it with everything you've got. He said, I want you to let go. Let go. I want you to start saying, God, I'm yours. Whatever you have for me, whatever you want from me, whatever you desire of me. Lord, I, I, Lord, you've put this great and amazing gift in my life. God, I want to give it back 100%.
I, I want to take, take the talent that you've blessed me with. I want to give it back 100%. I, I don't want to just use it for personal gain or personal glory. But God, I want it to be yours. God, I, I thank you for every day that you give me, God. I want to give my day back to you. I want you to have my time so you can multiply it and bless it. God, I want you to have my finances, however those finances look. I want you to have them, God, whether it's just a couple of coins or I got wealth, God, it belongs to you. Everything that I have belongs to you. And when you start doing that, you start breaking some spirits off your life. Sickness has to leave your life. Disease has to leave you. Because you're, you're, you, you're so wrapped up in this thing. of, Oh, man, if I just hold on to it, if I just squeeze it a little tighter, I'm going to have it to the end. And it's all you're going to have to the end. We break the spirit of mammon off of our life. This is not my God. This is not my God. You know, there's a passage of Scripture in the Bible. It says, cast your bread upon the water and come back to you, shaking down, pressed press down, shaking together and flowing over. And I've heard a lot of people take up an offering with that, but it's really not talking about money at all. It's talking about love. And when we love the things of this world, we can't love people because we're afraid that those people are going to take from us what we possess. Amen. That's a good word. And so we hold on to it and we're protecting it. So we see the guy on the street. And we already just size him up. Yeah. And we start thinking, he's probably in that trouble because he asked for it. Oh, here comes a guy at the gas station. They're going to want money. I'm, I'm getting my car. Quick. I'll, I wanted a full tank of gas, but I'm leaving. Shh. And look, I don't give money to everybody that comes up and asks me for money. I'll be honest with you. But I don't want to have a stingy spirit. I want to be able to have a generous spirit so the Holy Spirit can say, Hey, I need you to bless this person. Hey, I need you to, I need you to help that person. But if I have a stingy mammon God, I'm not even going to talk to that person. Much less wait on the Holy Spirit to talk to me because I got another voice speaking. Are y'all with me this morning? Yes. And Jesus takes us to Matthew 25 and he said, he said, be generous. Feed the poor. Clothe those who are without clothing visit those who are in prison but when have we done this Lord when you've done it unto the least of these you've done it unto me it's not just about our tithing that we give I just feel Holy Spirit just coming strong in this house this morning to break some things off because you know what we can give our 10% and still be stingy with our 90 we can say, well, I gave my tithe, so bless God, that's all you're going to get, Jesus. And that same spirit, what if, what if we just had a generous heart? Generous, generous, generous. You know, I find out about raising kids, they can be generous with your money. <laughs> they can. Like, my kids love to give out of my bank account. I feel a generous spirit coming on. Dad, give me some money. I'm like, well, what about your bank account? Because I want your bank account to multiply. Both in the natural and in the spiritual. Praise the Lord. That's a good word right there. Stand with me this morning.